Oh, can you mute your line? Oh, sorry about that. Okay, great. Okay, so let's get started right now. Hi, welcome to Speech Talk Live, episode number 28. My name is Jay Oza, and I'm the host of the show. And today we have Julie Finkelstein, who is a mentor for the Coursera course called Introduction to Public Speaking. And also, I'm a mentor too. So, what we try to do on this show is uh, like five, maybe five things, maybe six. One is uh, purpose is to learn, teach, share, practice, support, and also the, the sixth one is kind of important too, trust. We have to have trust so that nobody feels like that, uh, that, that they're going to be ridiculed or made you know, fun of for making any kind of mistakes because uh, let's face it, people have real fear of speaking. They just don't want to be rejected. On this show, nobody gets rejected. And look, we all have fear, and this is the only way to overcome it, by doing it. So that's just what we try to do. But we do something more than that. Uh, we don't just have people come on and talk about you know, simple stuff. We talk about things that are kind of a little interesting and challenging, because that's where the stakes are higher, right? If you're having small talk, that many people are very good at, but the stakes are not that high. Here, what we do is we look at some real examples of uh, speakers and then discuss it. So part of it is to learn from that and also to be able to discuss intelligently. And look, if you make mistake, you make mistake. You just come back next week and uh, try to do it uh, better next time. So uh, some of it you can prepare and some of it is just going to be kind of you know, ad-libbing because you can't really prepare when you're having a discussion. So I think this is a really good show. It has helped me a lot. And, and Julie can talk about how this show has helped her. And like I said, this is our 28th show. So we've gone through quite a few shows now where we have gotten more comfortable. You know, in the beginning, it was a little difficult. But now I think, you know, we're getting more comfortable uh, doing this show, more comfortable in front of camera. So if you're watching this, this is how it works. In the beginning, you're going to be a little... It may not be that good. You may not like it, but just keep doing it. And you know, you may not take twenty-eight shows. <laughs> Maybe we're not that good. Maybe you can do it in the next, you know, three, four shows. But still, you got to do it. You got to create that body of work. So today, we're going to focus on billionaires. And it's it's for us to understand how these billionaires think. And part of thinking is speaking. And we're going to look at three famous tech billionaires. Uh, Jeff Bezos, who's the founder of uh, Amazon. Then we'll look at Elon Musk, who has founded several companies, you know, uh, Tesla, SpaceX, SolarCity, and he used to be one of the founders of PayPal. And then we'll look at Larry Page, who is the founder, along with Sergey Brin, of Google. So this look listening to billionaires you can learn a lot first of all how they speak and you'll see three different styles here uh two of the two of them are in an interview form uh musk and page are being interviewed by one of them is interviewed musk is interviewed by chris anderson and page is interviewed by charlie rose uh jeff bezos gives a speech at a commencement at princeton so these are Two of them are interview. One of them is a speech in front of a, a, a large audience. But you get to learn a lot about how they speak, how passionate they are, and what we can learn from them. Uh, at least we may not be a billionaire when you look at our check account, but that doesn't mean we can't speak like a billionaire. So here's an opportunity for us to say, see, what can we learn from listening to these uh, uh, three top billionaires that everybody knows about? So that's the show. and. I'll turn it over to Julie to do a quick intro, and then we'll move on to our three-minute uh, speech segment. Julie? Hi, Jay. Good morning. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Jay. Um, my name is Julie, and I do two things. I'm a fellow mentor in the uh, Kosovo's Public Speaking, and with that, I have notes for the from the videotape. And then right now, I'm taking on Jay's 
uh, three in thirty challenge, which he'll talk to you more about. I'm making commentaries on some of the videos and plugging some of the holes. <coughs> the other thing I do is I facilitate meetings that help us uh, be more proactive in our lives and live our visions. <coughs> With that, on Saturday mornings, I have a read and discussion program. Uh, which we're reading the seven habits of highly effective people and we have uh, times for discussion and introductions. In addition on Wednesdays I'm starting uh, a Wednesday phone meeting which is about the follows the Napoleon Hill's idea of a mastermind where we get together share our vision and actions and then also get peer suggestions and feedback. For more information, give me a call, and Jay will share my uh, user uh, my email later. Thank you, Jay. Yeah, so <clears throat> I usually include Julie's email with, when, during her introduction. So, uh, well, obviously, if you're watching it, you're going to be seeing the email. If you're watching this live, you will get it. But typically, <laughs> when this is recorded, her email will appear when, when she's introducing herself. I always include uh, her name, her role, and uh, if there's anything else that I'm missing, Julie, let's let me know. I right now put you down as a mentor. If there's anything more that I need to put down, just let me know so I'm more accurate on some of the things that you're doing. And then I include her email below that. So let me just address something that Julie just mentioned that she's taking on this uh, 330 challenge. So simply the 330 challenge is the three is for three minute speech, roughly three, and 30 is 30 days. So uh, Initially, I thought this is the, one of the first things that somebody should do before taking the Coursera course on introduction to public speaking, because that course is a 10 week course, which is an excellent course. By the way, that is one of the best course that I've seen uh, and it's free and I haven't come across any course that's better than that. And I urge everybody to take that. But then Julie and uh, I think was a tool suggested that a better way would be if somebody's just kind of uh, new at public speaking, 330 may be too difficult. And I agree. And for so 330 is something you want to really do after you finish the course. So that way you will have a very good baseline on where you are with your speaking. And what it does is that if you record 30 straight speeches in 30 days, believe me, you're going to get comfortable after 30 speeches. I think you can start getting comfortable pretty much after 15, maybe even 10. But once it becomes a habit, then giving a speech and recording in front of a camera is going to be a breeze. And nowadays, cameras are persuasive, are pervasive. They're everywhere. They're, they're, you know, you can get a camera. They're in your uh, PC, and they're even on your uh, smartphone. So, recording a three-minute speech is not that burdensome like it used to be in the past. Today, it's simple. The question is, you know, are you going to spend the time doing it? And in the beginning, it may take about an hour. That's what it took me. But now I think after doing 30, it takes me probably less than 30 minutes, probably 30 minutes. So now I've, so I've done 330. Julie's currently, I think Julie, you're on probably several speeches you've already done in the 330 challenge. I think maybe close to 10. So Julie's already like uh, close to one, one fourth done with her 330 challenge. Uh, but then I said to myself after I finished it, what do I do now? So I call it now 330 plus because it never ends. So once you finish 330, it's a habit that should keep con should continue. Otherwise, your skills may start eroding. So once you finish 330, you don't have to do it every day, but you should at least do it at least once every other day. And I call that the 330 plus. So it's not a challenge at that point. It's something that you don't need a challenge since you already turned it into a habit. So at some point, Julie's going to finish her 330 challenge. Then I urge her to move into that next phase, which I think is an advanced phase, to so that her skills do not start diminishing. They just get better. And that will be the 330 plus phase. So at this point, uh, I'm going to move into our three minute uh, speech segment. And I'll take a quick break and then we'll start it, OK? Okay, welcome to Speech Talk Live, episode number 28. This is our three-minute speech segment that we do uh, before we get into the, the heart of our uh, uh, program, doing segments and evaluating speeches. So today, 
I am going to talk about something that I observed and it kind of floored me because I was just not expecting it and uh, I learned a lot and I attended my uh, son's school and they have this uh, fall sports awards so they had like lots of children high school students and parents and when the soccer team was introduced, the coach goes and introduces all the players. You know, these were freshmen, these were sophomore, these were varsity letter winners, etc. And then it was over. And, you know, just like all the different coaches come on and talk about how well they did, what was the highlights, what they plan to do next year, typical of what you would see. So that's pretty routine. And then another coach came. And then afterwards, that same soccer coach came back again and i was like why is he coming back what, what did he like why, why is he coming back and evidently he forgot one name and the name that he forgot he was not a player but he was somebody who was on the team in some sort of a, a, a as an assistant role i mean he's a student but this particular student uh has some physical disabilities that prevents him from growing. And evidently the coach felt really bad about that, that he left out this one key player and he was there, his parents were there. So the coach immediately gets on the mic when the other coach was finished. And the first thing he does is apologize. The well, first thing he does is not apologize. First thing is that he made a mistake. Okay, so that's number one. The second thing he apologizes to the student, the name that he forgot when he was acknowledging all the other students, he did not acknowledge him. He apologized to his parents because they were there. And this is a big event. This is an awards night, right? This is a fall sports award. And he was on the stage, he got his bow, but his name didn't get mentioned. Then he apologized to the audience. And then he made that student whole again saying, that he got that special recognition that other kids didn't get because he made a mistake. And I thought about that, you know, and I even went afterwards and, and told him, I said, listen, that was a very classy thing that you did because you taught something to these kids more than they'll ever know that when you do something wrong, you got to make it right, right away. You don't then think about like, okay, should I do it? What would I think? you did what was right you made a mistake and you didn't like uh, you, you know try to come up with excuses like oh i just forgot in this you knew about it and you did it immediately and let the consequence let the, whatever happens afterwards let that happen but your focus was on doing something right and i said i don't know if the kids learned that lesson but this was one of the most important lessons that kids don't learn even when they get into their adulthood they always look for excuses. If you do something wrong, there are three things you got to do. Admit you made a mistake. Second, apologize. And then how do you make that person whole again? And I said, I'm not sure whether the kids understood that, but that is one of the most important life lessons you just taught these kids that I hope they understood. And I said, you know, you should be proud of yourself. And I said, they're lucky to have you as a coach but more as a teacher, because you just taught them. I said, you didn't just teach them, you taught me that next time something like that happens, how to handle it. And I said, I didn't come to this event expecting to learn anything. And now I felt like I just got a life lesson from something that I just observed. And I said, I want to thank you for that. And what I'm going to do next is I'm going to send a letter uh, to the superintendent and the principal letting them know that this was a very important lesson that was taught in real life situation that you just don't see anymore and I was very impressed so I just wanted to use that as part of my three-minute uh, speech segment Julie thanks Jay <clears throat> that was very um, powerful speech um, yeah, I like the idea of make, admitting the mistake, apologizing, and making whole. Thank you. Now I learned that again. So you're spreading the power of that. Um, so I'll start my speech. So hello, fellow speakers and Jay. And today I want to talk a little 
but about what I have called it and talked about here. It's a success life cycle model. That's what I'm calling it today. Uh, most people, when they have a plan, when they have an idea, the first thing they do is they pull out the business plan. And to me, that's very frustrating because looking at it, you're supposed to know so much. Um, I think that in looking at the business plan, that's actually like already the fourth step in this model. So the way I have it, and I'll use the example of uh, the pro forma uh, financial statement. So in order for you to get funding, you need a pro forma financial statement. And when you first start, that's really too hard. So the first, two, the first stage of this for me is called envisioning. And at that point, I will go back and fill this out. But what I think you need to do is a pre forma statement. I'll go back and fill that in. And the second step is experimenting. In the experimentation phase, you, you actually do little scenarios, go out and talk to people. But the goal here is not to prove you're right or wrong, but just to gather information and to identify potential opportunities. So the object of experimentation is reality, surfacing reality. The next stage is piloting, and that's where you have proof of concept. At that point, you've gathered through your initial experimentation, you have a list of ideas you think that works, you have potential opportunities. So you want to put that together as a project plan, and you want to test that out. So it's a validation of your ideas and your plan. It's a small model of what you want to do, but it, the model has to be complete and scalable. So finally, you do roll out, and that's where you have a completed pro forma statement. And we know the pro forma statement is the financial statement you use to get funding. So there are various uh, deliverables and purposes for each of these steps. So for example, in envisioning the you have a financial statement already, but at that point, all you want to put down is very, very, um, whatever comes to your mind. So, it's, for example, I'm working with this guy, and he wants to be a coach, and all he knows at this point is he wants to make $50,000 plus net revenue. Okay, so in experimentation phase, what I would suggest he does is to put down some uh, metrics. So, every client him, for example, two hours, he needs to charge $200 an hour, and then that will give him uh, metrics of how many clients he needs to have to generate that $50,000 revenue. So that's just, a, that's just a scenario. Then he can go out and test that. Are my, thesis cor are my hypothesis correct? So in the, in, and then maybe he finds out that he can't really do coaching, but he could be a business consultant. And then every client he get, he will get, instead of two hours a week, he'll get 20 hours a week. And so the idea is everything could shift here. As Jay would say, things could pivot at that point. But it's low cost because you don't have anything rolled out. And then in pilot, then you actually say, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I think works. And you prove that. So in this case, you have a completed pro forma statement with all the line items, but at this point, you're not sure if that's what you want to go out for fundraising. At this point, you want to talk to your coach, and you say, this is my pro forma statement. Will, it, will I be able to get the money I want? So that's the validation and the proof of concept. So you don't go to someone and someone look at your pro forma and say, you know, this guy's not mature enough yet. So also the processes here, whatever you do, it has to be scalable to your full production. So finally, with all this stuff together, you have plenty of time to really know what you're doing. You can roll out the full-scale project. And then the final phase is feed and caring of your success, which is maintenance. And Stephen Covey will call that sharpening the soul. So in summary, there is five stages. Envisioning, grow, having a seed, get, 
The second stage is get growing the seed, experimenting and making the seed real. Third is making the seed alive and can grow into a tree. Pilot and validation and roll out, growing the tree fully, and then caring and feeding of the tree. Uh, so thank you. That's my speech. Oh, that's excellent. And uh, Julie, can I ask you a question? Yes, thank you. Yes, yeah, so this is for, like, if you want to, like, what would you use this for, this particular method, that this five-stage method that you just described, envisioning, experimenting, piloting, rolling out, and then caring, I think, was the last one? Yes, feeding and caring. Usually it's called maintenance because, actually, if you look at the company's budget, uh, I'll just take a segment of it, and I'll answer your question. Um, if you look at the IT budget, 80% of the budget goes to feeding and caring in the maintenance. So you need to use that 20% for all those new possibilities very carefully. Mm. Uh, in terms of uh, the size of project, I, I think it can be just something you do very small. Let's say today you want to go out shopping. You can apply this process. And you can scale up to a company vision, you know, and you can be collaborative. So the next stage in, in my process is uh, defining the deliverables and the activities for the deliverables for each of these steps. So this so is like, like a project management phases. Yes, except that by the time you have a project, that's a small segment of right, this whole right. life cycle. This is a much broader life cycle view. Oh, okay. Okay, so you're basically taking the ideas from PM and applying it to how you can apply it to anything. Yeah, actually it's more like an object orientation because if you look at any object, it has an existence life from everything in every object in this universe has a life cycle. There's an initiation, a maturation, a sustenance, and an ending, you know. Right. So it's really those four life cycles, and I'm right, right. applying it to success. Right. Because I, I had, if you remember that uh, when when we discussed the speaking athlete, I had uh, come up with not these, but I can see what this is for. Uh, that was just specifically for public speaking, because I took from what athletes do, right? And I said the first one was preparation. Second one, I think, was performance the third one was evaluation and then the fourth one was assessment so that's no i'm sorry the first one yeah i think not the preparation sorry the first one was not preparation first one was learning and training i think that's right the second one was preparation because preparation is for a specific event that you're preparing for then you would perform at the event then you do a quick immediate evaluation after you complete it Oh, and then, right. it's, then at some point, you need to do an assessment to see where you are and what you need to do to get better. So those were the five phases that we had discussed. So yes. this looks like it's something similar. The only thing I would suggest is when you use word like pro forma, you want to be careful because some people will immediately tune out because they might say, oh, my God, this is something I don't understand. So you may want to be careful there. If, if the people are financially savvy, then the pro forma word is not going to scare them. But if somebody that, like, I don't know, I heard of the word pro forma, but I'm not sure what that really means. And people okay. will be, yeah. Yeah, the whole point is if you want to do a business plan and you want to go, for, go forward, you have to do a pro forma. Okay, so my right. whole point is that, you can't start off the process with doing a pro forma. Right, right. Maybe I should say something like, as, uh, pro forma can be very scary, but this process will get you into it easily. Yeah, yeah, right. The, the only thing I'm saying is that you can't, whenever you introduce a word that is very specific to some particular area and you're applying it to another area, the burden is on you to make it clear that mm -hmm. think of pro forma as these are the things you're going to have to do like that. So they now know what pro forma is, right? Mm -hmm. That these are the things you need to do in order to get to the next step that's required in order to succeed. So we call that pro forma. 
but you don't need to be a financial. So that way they don't feel like, oh my God, oh, this is pro forma. What? Because that's a scary word, actually, when you say pro forma, you know, it's a, it's a Latin word, right? I don't know. It's but a pro I take forma, it's a, it's a Latin it. word. So once you start bringing Latin into it, it makes you look smarter, but I don't know if that makes sure. It, I just wanted to let you know that you want to be careful there. That if yeah, you're going to use a word that. like that, that uh, that's the only thing. Otherwise, I, th I, I, I like the idea. Okay, yeah. so let's uh, take a brief pause and we'll go on to our first segment. Okay. Welcome to Speech Talk Live episode number 28. My name is Jay Oza, and we are going to our first segment. And in this particular segment, uh, or the next two segments, uh, all three segments, we're going to look at uh, the billionaires, tech billionaires, uh, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, and uh, Larry Page when they appeared at the TED event. So these are all their TED Talks that I was able to uh, find. And we're going to use them to see how a billionaire speaks how he thinks, how he communicates, how he gets his message across. So we can, well, it's not going to make us a billionaire, but at least we know how to talk like one, at least, if, uh, if we have to talk to some important people. So the first one we're looking at is Jeff Bezos. And the one, the speech that, uh, that I included is the one that he gives uh, at a commencement address at Princeton University. And I think out of all the three speakers, this one was the best speech. And I think it's a little unfair because he's giving a speech. The other one, the other two, uh, Musk and Page, were actually being interviewed. So they, uh, this is a formal speech. The other two are more like an impromptu speeches. They're basically ask, uh, answering questions that's given to them by, in, in Musk's case, was Chris Anderson, who was the founder of TED, or he runs TED now. And the uh, other one was by Charlie Rose. So let's focus on Jeff Bezos. Of course, Jeff Bezos is the founder of uh, Amazon. And his net worth, I just looked at it, is something like close to 50 something like 60 billion now. So this, this guy's pretty rich, okay? There are a lot of zeros at the end of his bank account. And I like the way he gives the speech. He's trying to give some lessons uh, to the students at Princeton University who are graduating. And the way he speaks is very deliberate. He's not rushing his speech in any way. And he starts off with the story when he was uh, 10 years old and he's with his grandparents and he makes some clever remark about his grandmother smoking and he figures this out in his head and he was like so impressed like hey grandma that you're gonna cut your life by so many years and the grandma was like oh my god you know yes and she started crying and then he talks about how his uh, grandfather pulls the car over and tells him that, uh, uh, gives him this advice, says, Jeff, it's harder to be kind than clever. And then he goes into the, the meat of his speech. So he starts the speech out with a story. And I just like the way he tells the story. He, he tells it in a way that you find like, wow, I want to know what happened here. And, and he's like telling like, oh, I thought I did something so clever. But then he gets this life lesson from his grandfather that in life sometimes it's better to be kind than clever and then he kind of switches that and provides a lesson to where the main part of his speech is between gifts and choices so he was given this gift of being clever but he made the wrong choice by trying to by not being kind kindness is like choice you make right and he's telling these students that they have tremendous gifts, otherwise they wouldn't have gotten into Princeton. But the question is, what are the choices you're going to make? And then he goes through his life and he talks about, uh, I mean, Je Jeff Bezos graduated from Princeton University. I think he got a degree in computer science and electrical engineering, and he was a summa cum laude. So the guy was really smart. Uh, he went to one of the most prestigious universities and he finished among the top students. 
and he went to Wall Street, and then he had to make a choice once after he got married. I think it was around, he said he was about close to 30 years old, whether he should go and he saw the growth. Somehow he had access and he saw that internet was growing at something like 2,300%, which is unheard of. And he said, there's got to be something that he can do to uh, when something is growing that can add value to people. And he basically quit his job and he started this company called Amazon to sell books over the internet. And of course the rest is history. So the, the thing that I like about this listening to him, so if, oh, he's a billionaire, right? So what do we learn from his speaking style and then how he thinks? The speaking style with Jeff Bezos is that he's very clear. Everything he says in the speech, you understand. There's nothing in the speech that you say, well, I don't understand what he's saying here. He's very clear, very right to the point. There is nothing, there's no throwaway lines or anything. He uses nice dramatic effects to get his point across when he was young. All of these things, he's done it in a masterful way. And you can see that communication to him is very important. Uh, even though he's reading the speech, but the effects is still there. He's not just reading it like a drone. He's putting in a lot of uh, style. There's a lot of uh, passion in that. And then the way he's speaking is like, you kids, you're listening to somebody that you can learn from. That's his, like kind of his attitude here. And uh, and also the thing that I like about his speech is the way he uses pauses. He doesn't try to rush through anything. He's like, I have a message and I'm going to get this message across to you in a way that you're going to remember it for the rest of your life. That's how I perceived it when I, when I uh, look, viewed the speech. The, the other thing is the mindset of a billionaire. And that's the part that always interests me, that I want to know what makes this person tick? And what makes Jeff Bezos tick is that he's a thinker. He's thinking about all these things. That's what I want to know. Like, how is he thinking? And he gives them so many things like to think about that tells you that this is how he views the world. This is how he makes decisions when he says, you know, are you going to follow dogma or are you going to try to be original and he goes through like litany of things that he's telling these people you know are you going to play it safe are you going to take risk etc cetera, etc cetera. and th then he basically said in his life he had an uh, he had an opportunity to play it safe and he didn't and he said that you're going to run into that that at some point in life you're going to have that opportunity where you can play it safe or you're going to take a risk and i like the way he ends the ends the, the the speech and he said in the end we are our choices build your build yourself a great story and i mean that is so perfect that it's similar to what steve jobs said in his commencement address right that you can't uh, connect the dots the dots they connect afterwards and he's saying is make your choices you know you are what the choices you make and then at the at the end even if they don't work out, you're creating your own story. That's unique to you. And uh, that's what life is all about. So I thought this was a very effective speech. And I would highly recommend people view it for a number of reasons. One is you get to see how a billionaire thinks and how he's able to take that thought and communicate it in a clear, concise, and an impactful way. And and you kind of get to understand that that's the kind of mindset you need to be successful. So I thought I learned a lot from from uh, watching this speech. Uh, Julie? Thanks, Jay. Yeah, I, I think that this is a, I really appreciate the theme uh, for this talk and next week's, uh, considering we are at the end of the year and we're doing um, I, I am doing uh, several Vision Crest activities. One of them is I'm meeting with uh, three of my friends online, and we're doing a vision project, a vision quest. So I, what I find out, what I think the most important for all three of them is that they think big, and they take risk, and they care. Um, Basil's speech was, I think, the most emotional, has the greatest of emotional tone, 
And I think that is because of the st he started off with such a personal story about and he uses emotional words like adored and it was such a joyful time for him. And um, I appreciate what you said too that he started saying uh, the dogma of being original, be safe or take risk or be kind or be clever. Those are the three matrices of choices. And he went on to say he took risks. Um, and also at the end, when you're 80 years old, you are your choices. I can relate to that because when my son graduated from college, he had this giant vision. He wanted to go to Shanghai and be a big business person. He did not succeed. He, he used up a lot of the money we saved up for him, for his launching pad. But I think, uh, it, like uh, you said about Steve's job, we don't know where the dots are going to connect it. Uh, so, and then he, then he decided he wanted to be a fashion designer. And then he wanted to be in the fashion business. And so he went through a lot of steps at the tender age of 29. And now he, he moved to New York and he became uh, in the finance sector, Morgan Stanley, and now he's working with uh, REIT. So I think somehow, I think I did something right. He is definitely taking risks and I appreciate the stories. It makes me feel like, uh, you're helping me to feel like uh, a, a more peaceful mother because I cannot connect the dots, and I have to f have faith, and I'm glad he's taking risks. So very good speech. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, oh, that's a, that's a nice story. Uh, I, I think the part that I like about what he says, I think, is something that I, I need to, I try to make sure, because, you know, we're Asian parents. We want our kids to do well. But sometimes it's not what we want. It's what they want, right? And it, it sometimes you just have to give this type of an advice because sometimes we limit our children's choices. I did not do that with my daughter. My daughter is uh, currently working at a company called Mashable, and uh, you know she could have gone into. I knew early on she was not cut out for medicine or engineering or even computer science. So I didn't even bother pushing her. I said, listen, whatever you want, but be the best in whatever you want. Go all out. If you pick something like she went into communications, I said, if you want to go into communications and PR, then be the best in that. And then when she had to, when she graduated uh, this year, she kind of got a run around trying to get a job in the PR. So I said at that point, uh, you need to pivot and get something and maybe something else will come up. I said, maybe you need to look at sales, maybe something else. And then she landed this job. She had two offers and she took this one uh, uh, at Mashable and she likes it there. So I said, sometimes you can come out of college thinking I'm gonna do this, but then it, it may not work out. When you go into real life and try to test it, you find out that that's not what you wanted is not what you're going to get. And then at that point, you have to really like, you know, make a decision. What do you do? And now she really likes it uh, at this company. And in fact, uh, she was telling me that she's just finished more than three months now and she's pretty happy there. So I said, yeah, just keep doing it. You never know. Don't fall into this thing that I have to be this because I got my degree in this. Don't go, let, don't let the degree define because I got my degree in electro, electrical engineering and I never got a single job where I actually ever had to work with circuitry or anything like that. I never did that. I was more interested in computers, I mean software. So th that's a thing that we do have to remember is that at the end you have to, like you worked for many years, Julie, so if you had to build a story, that's your story. That's unique to you. You can go through right from your story coming from uh, uh, Hong Kong or from China and work your way up to starting several companies and now to the current state. And in fact, I did that recently, not my history of what I did, but I'm currently, as you know, writing a book. And one of the chapters that I just finished was my speaker's journey. And it kind of starts right from my schooling in India to the present. 
and I talk about like the highlights, the lowlights of all the different places where I really realized that I needed to improve my, at some point I didn't even know I had to improve because I didn't know any better. And then some of the embarrassment that I had to go through in order to realize that I had to really, so that became my story. So I can relate to what he's saying here, build your own story, uh, build, no, sorry, build yourself a great story. And in my case, it is a true story that as far as my speaker's journey is concerned. And I like that advice that the, at the end, we are our choices. And some of those choices I made, some of the choices I stumbled into, but at the end, that is my story. And, uh, and I think as, as, a, as a person, we have to do it. And as a parent, it's important that we do the same thing with our children, that they have to, you can help them, guide them in making decisions, but it's their, their choices that they have to make. And it's their story. You don't own that, they own it. Any closing thoughts? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Very wise. I appreciate that. At this point, we'll move on to our next segment. OK, welcome to Speech Talk Live, episode 28. My name is Jay Oza. And the theme of this week is looking at uh, tech billionaires. And in the second segment, we're going to look at uh, an interview that Elon Musk uh, does at the TED event uh, with uh, Chris Anderson. So Elon Musk is a very interesting person. And uh, this is a Q&A form where he's answering questions. A and you, you can tell the passion just oozes out of when he's talking about different things. And what makes Elon Musk so interesting not to me, to everybody, is that he has taken different industries. He's He started out in the e-commerce space, right, with PayPal. Then once that company was sold, he took that, the fortune that he made, I don't know, several hundred million dollars, and he started a company called SpaceX. That's it, rockets, go to space, preferably Mars. Then he started another company called Tesla that's making these electric cars that everybody raves about. And then also he has uh, built another company called Solar City to bring uh, solar power. So there is a common theme when you look at Elon Musk, uh, especially the three companies that he started after he uh, sold PayPal. It has to do with reusability. Everything is about sustainability and reusability. There's that common theme there. And he's looking at it like, how do I make something that's already there make it better that nobody's even bothered to think about? So when it comes to a Tesla, it's not just that he's building these great cars. That's there. But there's something else that really he's doing is how do we say it's it's an energy it's it's like how do we use energy more efficiently and cars consume a lot of uh, carbons right hydrocarbons I think uh, it's very expensive a lot of we use a lot of fuel there's a lot of uh, carbon uh, that's emitted and his main mission there is that how do I reduce it to reduce it he needs to make these electric cars very popular and he describes that right now it's unaffordable. They cost, uh, I don't know, quite a bit, uh, probably like over 50000 I don't know, maybe 100000 That's the first phase. Then he says second phase, it'll come down to, and then at the third phase, then it becomes mass market, and that's what he's trying to get to. Uh, so the, he said when, when and the other thing I think he talks about here is how we use up, it's not just energy, it's also space. The world is gonna keep getting crowded, especially cities. And if the cars can be electric, and especially if they could be driverless, then just imagine how much space we, we could eliminate, right? So he's thinking in a different way altogether. It's not that he's just, if you simplistically, you can say yes, uh, that he's looking at, a, he's building a car. But that's not like uh, Julie mentioned, this is a concept of thinking big. He's thinking much beyond that, right? He's already two, three layers above what ordinary people think. We all think like, oh, he's just building these fantastic cars, but he's doing much more than that. He's solving 
some of the biggest problem with the car. Car is just a vehicle, if I may use the pun, to solve to solve some bigger problems that that uh, that he wants to solve. That's his mission uh, when it comes to Tesla, when it comes to Solar City, and when it comes to even SpaceX. Uh, SpaceX is launching rockets and exploring space, right? Sending his goal there is always to think big, is to send people to Mars to kind of uh, not colonize it, but so that people can actually travel to Mars. And there you have to solve some big problems. The current way of doing it, it there's a lot of, uh, it's not reusable. The rockets cannot be reused. And he was explaining how much that costs. If you can reuse the rocket, then you can, it's possible for you to go to Mars and it's affordable. So he, he look, he kind of combines many different things, but at the end, just like Jeff Bezos, how is this, how can a customer benefit from this, right? He's doing all these things, but at the end, if you can't do it, then what's the point of it? So like right now, many of us can't afford his cars, but at some point, that's what he wants for us to be able to afford his car. And if everybody can afford it, then he can solve his bigger problem, right? Because if, if we're able to buy a Tesla, that means we're not driving a car that requires gas. So he wins that way, right? And he, everybody wins. So his point is not that he wins. He's going to do well no matter what. But he wants, as part of his legacy, he wants the whole, while he's here, he wants every the whole uh, the, uh, the, the planet to do well. So they think in a totally different way. That's why I like this speech. And here he has examples of uh, like how he combines his vision, his knowledge, his talent, his, and, and his business acumen and to realize his, his overall vision. So uh, as far as his speaking is concerned, I think he could have been simpler at some point. At some point, I kind of got lost. I had to look at the transcript. So I'm not sure if I had heard it live, I would have picked up some of the things because he just got a little too techy when he was explaining some of the uh, percentage. When people start throwing out statistics and stuff, it's kind of hard to follow. Uh, if you look at Jeff Bezos' speech, there were no statistics given. In fact, it was the statistics that got him into trouble in the first place when he started doing math. Uh, this speech, in some cases, when it was talking about Tesla, he got into like like 60% is wasted and then 20% is wasted. I, I think that just goes to show like how much he knows about this topic and how much uh, uh, research that he has done in, in, uh, in all of these different areas, such as cars, solar power, and also, you know, space, uh, spaceships, rockets. So I was, uh, you know, again, part of it was how he addresses these questions in a Q&A, like an impromptu, and he does it very well with like one, two, like that. He, he, he gets to the point right away. Uh, second is you get to understand how he thinks and what makes him tick. And I thought we got that pretty clearly. And the guy who interviewed him did, a, did an excellent job, really challenged him to really get into his mindset. And I like what he said at the end on how he thinks counterintuitively, like physics, how science is so important in his thinking, not just analogy, just make it a little better. He wants to make it a lot better. That requires a different type of thinking. And when you are like Elon Musk, I like what he says at the end about a negative feedback that he values negative feedback because that means he solicits it as he says it I solicit negative feedback not as a way of like oh how dare you shoot down my argument so I learned that so from a speaking point of view that's something that you know we try to do on the show where we will not give people any kind of feedback unless it's solicited so if Julie asks me, Jay, what can I do better with my speech? Is there anything here that you see that I could have done better? And that's what you need in order to get better. If you're afraid to do that, then you're not going to get better. So part of fear is, do you want to get better? Fear of getting better. And what he wants to do is he wants to get better. He wants to make sure that his vision is right. He wants to get challenged, uh, whether he's on the right track. And he wants to hear things that people are not sure of. And I think that was very valuable. Even if you take that one simple advice, I think you can do so much better. Uh, Julie? Thanks, Jay. Yeah, uh, so I, first of all, I do want to say I welcome feedback from you anytime, uh, whether it's negative or positive. Um, and I would prefer to be constructive, 
but it doesn't have to be now that I've seen the speech. Um, so I, first of all, I agree with you um, that the speech was very interesting. I really did not pay too much attention to the statistics. So there was a couple of things that um, interesting. One of it is the the scope of his vision. You know, he's looking at the word he used in there was humanity. So whereas um, Bezos' speech was about focusing on the individual because it was a graduation speech, he. Elon Musk was clearly like looking at what humanity, where, where will humanity be? And so that was all inspiring. And he did talk about, he, the other word that he used a lot was interplanetary, interplanetary. So he does have a vision of human beings going beyond Earth. Um, uh, so, um, I mean, to me as myself, I think I have pretty big vision, which very little piece get done, but I really appreciate his vision. There was a there was a point where, where he was talking about the solar panel. Well, there was a couple of points that he's. I think he wasn't completely forthcoming. One of it was when he used the example um, that he said this uh, electric car can, can get so many mileage, and then uh, the speaker said, "Well, this guy." is right here and he's driving at 18 miles an hour. So I think Musk was not completely candid, that's how I feel. So at that point he break the sense of trust I have for him. The other the other place that was also a little bit of a break breaking trust was when um, they were talking about the solar panels and he was providing a, the value proposition and the speaker said and what's your take? And he never answered that question. Uh, I, I would prefer that he was a little bit more forthcoming. Um, in terms of uh, his uh, last last top point, I thought that was really important, is you covered it already, is about uh, how to come up with quantumly different levels of solutions. And what he said was, look at physics. And the way I interpret that was, um, and he may have said it, is to go back to the fundamentals, look at the fundamental laws. So in this case, he was using physical laws, but I believe there's basic um, human laws too of emotion and psychology. That so whenever we want to be like explosively creative, we need to go dig deeper inside um, and look at the fundamentals again. Uh, which kind of sets with me into the next speech, uh, look, looking at deep mind. Um, overall, uh, all inspiring because of his the the scope of his vision, which was on the whole humanity. Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> no, that was uh, that was good. Uh, there's a few things I want to add here, and. All of those, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. And I think, because one of the things I'm asking myself is, why did he do a Q&A instead of just giving a talk? So I'm not sure about that. I don't know if I, if it's just that he's uncomfortable with that format or he doesn't like doing giving speeches. Because I was kind of a little puzzled. Like, these guys have given a lot of speeches at a TED event. Why not just give a, a speech? Or maybe he's more comfortable in a Q&A format. I don't know. Maybe that's the way they arranged it because it doesn't make sense because that's not typical TED format, what he just uh, did at that uh, at the TED event. The, the other thing is uh, I, I definitely agree with what he said about this system level of thinking that if you want to make a quantum leap, like he talks about it, and this may be something we should talk about at a separate uh, 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 discussion topic, but I'll just briefly mention it that he talks about the way he thinks and the way we t typically, the one by analogy, and his is to break something down to its fundamental truths. And I was thinking about this and I said, you know, that's something we also need to do about speaking because a lot of times we take a speech, we look at speech that has already been given and we see how much we can make it better. Like here, take a look at Martin Luther King, take a look at John F. Kennedy, take a look at this, and this is how you have to speak. 
And that's through analogy, I think. You know, we're saying, okay, here's a speech, see if you can do it like that. And one of the things that uh, I thought about after watching this speech is that something that I had already discussed, and I'm not saying I'm at Elon Musk level here, but this whole lean speech concept is sort of like that, right? Where we're breaking it down to a single word and then building it up from there to build a speech rather than here's a speech, this is similar to what this person has given, see if you can make it something similar to that. That's by analogy. And I'm not sure, maybe you can see if this makes any sense to you. What I'm saying is that don't do a speech like that. Do it from the bottom. And that's kind of what he's doing here. He's taking every field and he's starting from the bottom and he's not accepting anything. He's saying, I need to know the basics at everything, because some of those truths and then build it up from there. And that's how he's able to make these quantum leaps because we tend to have accepted so many things that we don't even bother with it, that maybe some of those things may not even be 100% correct or nobody's ever tried to challenge some of those things. And that's what uh, I like about what he's doing with his type of thinking. The one thing I'll say is that he doesn't have a good sense of humor. <laughs> and also, he he should have given an attribution to this when, the, when, when he said, uh, you know, why did he go into space? And he said, well, uh, that, you know, you start with large and then it becomes small. That quote really is what he's saying is what something that Warren Buffett once said, that why uh, not by like how to become a millionaire. And Warren Buffett said, well, you start with a billion dollars and you buy an airline so that you'll become a millionaire, you know, and that's essentially what he's saying here. But it would have been good if he had given that attribution to say that, you know, I'd like to take some of what Warren Buffett said about starting an airline that, you know, start with the billion. So that's what I'm trying to <laughs> prove here, that if I'm, I'm trying to become a millionaire, he could have been more funny that way. But as you can see, that's not that's not his thing. So, you know, you can't fault him on that. But uh, I just wanted to point that out, that humor is something that you have to be careful and also you should have rehearsed it. I'm sure that question has been asked to him many times and he should have nailed it. And I was kind of little, I just wanted to point that out. Not that it diminishes his speech in any way, but as you can see, he works on thinking, but he needs to work also on his humor part a little bit more. Uh, Julie, any, any closing thoughts? No, no, you, you, you muted your line. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, I, I don't expect these guys to be funny, so I, so I didn't pick that up, but now you're funny. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you, humor is something, uh, and this is outside. I think, <clears throat> I think when you are a CEO, when you have a, something important to talk about, humor is very important because that's, that's how you can cut your message, get your message across very, I thought Bezos was quite a humorous. I thought Bezos was kind of humorous. And I think humor is very important when you're doing things that are, I mean, he was try. I, I don't want to fault him at his attempt at a humor. When the guy asked him about why did he go into space? And he said, you know, I'm trying to, he didn't use the word billionaire to a millionaire, but that joke has been there for a while. Okay. That's not something that he's, he just created. Uh, Warren Buffett has been using that for a long time that about airline industry and i think that's pretty funny because airline industries typically lose money so you start with a billion and i think uh, richard branson even uses that so uh, when you use it give the attribution don't like we talked about that give the attribution if it's not yours and uh, this is something i'm sure he's been using it uh, quite a bit so uh, i i thought overall just to close this out i thought that uh, you got to see a mindset of a person who's driven, who has a vision, and who has like a, a methodology. So there's a lot of things here in the speech that shows to people, like if, if somebody's watching this and saying like, what do I get out of this? Okay, he's Elon Musk. I'm not like Elon Musk. And I think that's a wrong way of looking at it. I think we could all be like Elon Musk. And that's the whole point, that these billionaires are very successful because they do things in a, some very unique way. And is that just unique to them? I don't think so. I just think that unless we're willing to go through what they go through and trying to look at the world the way they look at and have a vision, I think you can all be successful, whether that's going to lead to, you know, the measurement is not whether how many zeros you have after your account, 
The measure is what kind of impact you're making. And I mean, we, you and me are kind of trying to make that kind of an impact, you know? I mean, are we in the Elon Musk? Who knows? That's how it starts, right? At some point, we are trying to make impact in the way people develop their confidence, uh, reduce their fear. And if you can do that, then you can achieve just about anything. And that's the kind of impact that we want to make. And that's the kind of impact that Elon Musk and uh, Jeff Bezos and uh, uh, Larry Page are trying to make. So impact is defined by you. It doesn't. It does, doesn't get defined by how big your uh, your net worth is. So I just want to make that clear that we can all think like these billionaires and speak like these billionaires, uh, but that shouldn't be defined. I think these guys would be doing it even if they weren't billionaires because that's how driven they are. Uh, any closing thoughts, Julie, before we move on to our next segment? Uh, I agree. Thank you. Yeah, very much so. Okay, we'll move on to our next segment. Thanks a lot. Okay, welcome to Speech Talk Live, episode 28. My name is Jay Oza, and we're going to move to segment number three. And this week's theme is uh, lo looking at uh, the, the TED Talks of some of the famous uh, tech billionaires. We've looked at Jeff Bezos. We looked at Elon Musk. In this particular segment, we're going to look at Larry Page, uh, who was a founder, is a founder of Google with Sergey Brin. And in this particular talk, he's being interviewed by this famous uh, journalist uh, named Charlie Rose. <clears throat> so obviously, Larry Page is a pretty wealthy guy, probably worth more than $50 billion. And again, uh, evidently, he suffers from some kind of, uh, he had some kind of vocal cord surgery or something. So his voice is kind of hoarse. And in, in a way, it kind of, works in this because it makes him, I don't know whether this is the way he is, but probably he is, but just the voice alone makes him really connect because you want to, he can't speak loud because he had to get some kind of surgery, I believe. But it wants, it makes you want to listen to him because this guy, he's very successful and his demeanor is very like low key. He's not trying to, He's basically saying, look, this is what I do. I want to, again, his vision is uh, on how, to, like, you know, one of the mission for Google was to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. So they've had this vision from the beginning, and they've kind of stuck to it. But they haven't stopped there. And that's what really fascinates me about these uh, billionaires that when you're not a billionaire, you always tend to say like, oh, you know, why are you working so hard? You already made your money. You should just rest now. You know, you can just do so many other things. And that's not how they think. For them, that's not what they're all about. They're all about trying to challenge themselves, uh, trying to, the, the money is there. So that means they don't have to worry about that one aspect of it. But that means that because that part is removed, it gives them more of an opportunity to focus on things that really impacts lives. And that's how, that's how they use their money. So they're not like looking at it it's like, oh, today, uh, let's see, I made uh, $10 billion. So yesterday I lost $10 billion. That's not how they view the world. Because like I said, how much money do you need? They got more money than God probably at this point. But the problems are still massive. And as he's talking about something that looked kind of simple that's so difficult for machines is recognizing people, how machines play games. And you can see the passion. Like, like, like when you watch it, you think like, wow, you know, machines are having all this difficulty doing things that we take it for granted, like playing video games. And he's like so into it. Like this is, look at, look at the progress we're making, even though it doesn't look big. But this is the future. And, and some of it is somewhat scary, too, because uh, machines are going to play more and more important role. And Google is at the forefront of it. Like, uh, in some ways, it's going to be very helpful. In some ways, we don't know what it's going to do as far as uh, employment and all that is concerned. Uh, and those are some of the challenges that uh, you know, many of these uh, billionaires 
also have to think about that, uh, yes, these advances are good. I think they are driven that they're not even looking at it, some of the, the negative aspects of advancement and how does that work? Like, how do we, when you leave people behind, but he's not focused, he's looking at what, what are the benefits. And in one a little uh, uh, a video that he shows about this uh, man in Africa, how he was able to get information from Google and make his life better and then how they're able to bring internet access using balloons. So what he's trying to do is that let information get to people and let them determine what happens. He's not worrying about the consequences. If that if you make information available, people will use it for good. And at the end, good will overcome potential bad that's out there that we, you know, we see with some of the things that are going on in the world with terrorism and all that. But these guys are just focusing on the good of technology, but they don't seem to really focus on some of the negative aspect of technology either. And I'm not sure that they they may care, but I'm not sure that that's what they really focus on because their focus is on how to take the technology to the next level and improve people's lives, according to them. So uh, I, I think from a from a speech perspective, I think he connected because of the way he just talks and the, the, the passion that he shows that, you know, there's so many massive problems that still need to be solved. And, you know, with technology, with him, technology is the way to solve it, right? And again, you want to understand the mindset of these billionaires, you know, what makes them think. And we looked at Elon Musk, what makes him think, that whole system level of thinking, getting down to the fundamental truths and then make this quantum leap. Here, uh, Larry Page talks about invention and then innovation and then how does that uh, uh, make people's life better. So he's kind of combining, like you take it from invention to innovation, but then it has to scale. So in a way, it's kind of similar to all these three guys are scaling. Whatever they've developed, Jeff Bezos, scale, you know, with his uh, uh, e-commerce site, uh, Amazon.com, or his uh, uh, cloud computing site, uh, AWS. Same thing with uh, Elon Musk is trying to do. Everything has to scale because if it doesn't come down to each of us benefiting, then it's not, that's not what they're looking for. At the end, it has to benefit each of us individually. So I, I, I like what he had to say here, and I like the way he says it. And uh, I, thought, I thought he did a good job, very good job. Julie, what do you think? Yeah, thanks, Jay. So you mentioned this, that Larry Page was um, sharing his mission, and I thought that was a pretty amazing vision organize the world information, make it accessible and useful. And I agree with you that he's very passionate. And the speech became very personal when he talked about his own problem with his voice and that uh, he talked to his partner, Sergey. And uh, um, even, that, even with his problems, he came out in public. I would imagine he's much more of a private person. In looking at this, um, in his vision, I think he really um, was very brave in his uh, in, in the way he made the decision to China. You know, it was because of his stance of being public uh, that China banned Google altogether. I I don't know what the issue is, but. Um, when he talked about search and privacy, the amount of data, he says that his path is to make choice, uh, to make the information available, and then people has to make the choice. You know, and he talks about the baby and the bathwater, um, and the deep mind. He talks about the deep mind and showing its capacities for intelligence, and he mentioned that. Um, the, the developer is both a cybernetic engine, uh, expert, a computer science expert, and a neuroscientist. Um, I, have, I have deep concerns about the direction of the computers because of the um, human beings are not wise. 
um, you know, I've been with several Zen centers and each of them has its own personal scandals and problems. And it concerns me when he talks about the deep mind that uh, a one person's mind or a very select people number of people's mind is scaled across the whole uh, fabric of the information system across the world. Um, He's, he, he made a sense that make, make the choice public and that people can choose. I, I think what it's coming down to is that we have to be information lit literate. You know, if we're able to make those choices, not from emotion or fear or uh, over optimism, we have to be informed consumers of information. And he did mention this uh, issue about the Snowden and privacy. And he says the governments should be more open. I agree that governments should be more open, but what if they're not? And I think what if Google is not or Elon Musk is not? And how can we really count every one of them being completely open? So. Uh, in one point he mentioned just let us know the parameters and I'm not sure the governments will do that in terms of uh, the parameters of what security means and not the specifics because anybody who's smart can go from the parameters into the specifics. So uh, Larry Page's uh, presentation as a presentation was very deep and cogent but for me uh, erases a lot of issues uh, just in terms of his, uh, his positioning, his invention, which is uh, information, if it's accessible, it's useful. Don't throw the baby out with the bath water and then let the people choose. You know, there's a lot of underlying things. How can people choose if they're not on the same page, if they're not equally informed or knowledgeable? It makes me sound like a Luddite, but uh, there's a lot of uh, issues to be addressed. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think that's the whole point of this uh, talk is to get us to start thinking about some of these, uh, you know, some of these issues. And I think one of the things he says about is that, that you know, Google is, is, is quite wealthy, right? I mean, he's worth probably over $50 billion. And then people at Google are, are very, very wealthy. But Google makes up a very tiny percentage of a company. And when you start seeing that there are so many of these companies like Google, Apple, Facebook, and all of them are so dominating that, that you start to wonder that a lot of the people are simply going to fall behind. And there's just no way they can ever ever catch up because uh, the the world is moving so fast that if you miss the boat, uh, there isn't another boat coming that you can get on that quickly. And and one of the things I always see all these companies uh, <clears throat> like even Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates and they all want to be in the field of education, but I think they need to understand that. Uh, Education is one of those things we we need to be. It's not like education early. It's education all the time now, right? And that's something that we're doing. We're educating ourselves. Like I don't know how many people are doing this type of analysis that you and I are doing right now with what just Larry Pate said in the speech. What this means is that the the way, and this is kind of outside the scope, but it's kind of tied to the technology that we need to kind of constantly improve our skill set and companies no longer are doing that in the past they used to they used to give you a lot of time to take courses and educate yourself and at some point make contribution there was a different agreement between an employer and employer that is all broken down now exception with google so google is an exception so when you look at google and saying this is how the world should be this is how the companies are that's what Google does. The rest of the companies are not doing that. They can't and they won't because that's not how they work. They're very, they think in a different way. So when you look at Google, you're looking in the ideal world of what a corporation should be, but that's not the reality outside Google world and Facebook world and some of these other companies, right? And one of the things that is that today, I think people need to spend more time learning 
than doing because there's so much new stuff out there that you have to learn in order to do. But the corporations are not doing that. In fact, there was an article that I read in the uh, Harvard Business Review just uh, recently about how to bring creativity in workplace and in companies. And that's hard because I think I even did a speech on this, creativity versus productivity. And companies are designed to be productive, not creative. Creative is very hard to measure and you don't even know uh, if companies, they all pay lip service to creativity. But part of creativity is that you're gonna have to fail a lot. And how many times our companies are gonna give you that opportunity to fail a lot, to learn different things, to just come into the office and just go on the internet and look at Twitter feeds and try to come up with something. That's not how companies will measure you. If, you, if they see you doing that and saying, hey, today I went on this site, I went to this site, I went to this site, they're going to fire you and saying, hey, listen, you got to do your work. You're not here to do. And that's what creativity is. That creativity is not something that there is a science behind creativity. Creativity could come from anywhere. Like I just said, I went to this uh, talk at uh, at my son's uh, uh, awards uh, uh, show, uh, night uh, on, on Wednesday. And suddenly I came up with several ideas there. That's creativity. Creativity is not something you can confine to a set time frame. Like, okay, you got to come. Creativity only comes happens between nine to five, and it, it's a it's a problem that technology is bringing now. That how much work can you do, and how much learning you have to do? And I'm not sure companies have even addressed that. That we are in a kind of a, that. And let's face it, learning is not easy. Okay, and this is another thing that a lot of these people don't quite understand. Uh, I mean, you are you like to learn because you're curious. I'm like that too. I'm curious. I like to learn. But I know so many people out there. They're just happy collecting paycheck every every month or every week, and and they don't want to learn anything because why should they? They look at their life as like, well, I'm making a I'm making a decent living. Why do I need to learn anything? And at some point, those type of jobs are going to disappear. It's just a matter of time. And the question is, then they're going to all say, oh, the economy stinks, oh, what is this doing? And a lot of it is that individual responsibility in learning. I just i am not seeing people out there taking learning that seriously. And companies obviously are not because they're just mode, they're in the mode of productivity. That's how they measure. So it's a difficult problem and the technology is getting faster and faster in, in, in advancing so rapidly that how much can you learn at some point? And at what point you get to the saturation point where people just say, I've had enough of this. I just can't take it anymore. So anyway, uh, that's something that Google and all these companies are, they're addressing it, but I'm not sure they have a solution to any of this yet. Well, interesting. I think um, I took a class in global trends from, uh, from Coursera and this whole idea of this whole worldwide trend thing is it's a, uh, it's the individualism, the mythos, the, the shifting of the responsibility to individuals. And um, yeah, you know, maybe we can do a speech on uh, individualism, accountabilities, what that means. And also, I think that some of the accountability have to shift back into organizations and or governments because the whole 90 the whole 90-10 uh, phenomena is this myth that uh, individuals can bootstrap themselves. I think that individuals need to see the reality of things, but on the other hand, part of, um, part of the group conscience or the community of activism is to hold our, organi our service organizations and even uh, for-profit organizations accountable for what they can deliver to support our knowledge, our, our learning process. <clears throat> there is a, there's a thing that I used to say. I don't know exactly how I said it. I have to look it up. But uh, you heard of this thing called paradox of choices, right? That when you have a lot of choices, you tend to not make good choice because you got to your, your brain gets overloaded with too much information, right? And I think the same thing is is happening. So one time I was thinking about something, and I looked at uh, the situation in Afghanistan, specifically with Taliban, 
and the situation here in America. And I came up with this thing. And I said, you know, when you start to think of it, we're not that different in one ways. The, the, the Taliban are not getting smarter because they don't have access to information. But in a similar sense, we're also in a similar, uh, similarly, we have too much information. So that means that we can't get smarter either because there's just too much. And at that point, you just say, screw it. I just don't want to know anything more. And the result is the same. You've got two people that are going to be constantly fighting with each other because they're not growing, they're not getting smarter. One has lack of information, and the other one has too much information. So what is the right balance there? And that's kind of what's happening. Like, you know, all these Google and all these sites are great, but people get a lot of information, but I'm not sure how that makes you any smarter unless you're willing to sit down and do what you and I are doing, able to talk to each other and reason it out. Let's face it, we can't even get more than one person on this show. And this is the kind of thinking that you need in order to grow uh, you know, intellectually, spiritually, and all that. And people just are have too much information that they just can't grow anymore. Uh, I just wanted to get your thought on that, because there's some spiritual aspect to that too. Uh, you're muted. Yeah, at the end, uh, there is a spiritual aspect, but the truth of the matter is, I think, uh, you know, in this modern environment, uh, the systems that we created has to support us, you know, whether it's government or, uh, or companies. It's not, we have to have a humanistic approach. We cannot be based on the um, pure capitalism, you know, out for maximum benefits without uh, any sense of morality or community. Uh, the world is a system, and ecology itself is a system, and so we have to respect the larger. Um, we have to respect the larger system, and honor honor the interrelationships, the synergy, and the dynamism of that. Okay, Julie. Uh, yeah, we could discuss this for another half hour or even longer, so we'll carry on next time. But I thought all these three talks were good. I learned a lot, and I appreciate your uh, input and, and contribution. So again, let me thank you for joining this uh, show and adding your insight and uh, your, your, your opinion on all these things. So again, thank you very much, and I'll see you uh, next week. And next week, we're going to look at the female billionaires. Okay, thanks so much, Jay. Okay, bye. Okay, bye. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Bye.